Greetings from the Dark Continent, Conscious Caracal here, or Aaron van Sale, and today we'll be looking at the topic of foundation myths. A foundation or origin myth develops over time to serve as the foundation of a culture, people, city, or civilization. Such myths are typically presented as a grand narrative and function to justify and explain the current state of affairs, with the events, entities, and forces described therein often being considered sacred. The reference here to the concept of a myth does not imply that the story is necessarily fictional, however, rather that the generational legend has taken on a mythical nature, while it often entails certain supernatural, eternal or archetypical elements. The Romans had the origin myth of Romulus and Remus, the Americans have the 1776 Declaration of Independence, their founding fathers and the US Constitution as a sacred document. The English have, among others, the Battle of Hastings of 1066 and the Magna Carta of 1215. For the Afrikaners of Southern Africa, the arrival of Jan van Riebeek in the Cape of Good Hope in 1652, the Great Trek between 1835 and 1854, and the Battle of Blood River of 1838, as well as the Anglo-Boer War between 1899 and 1902, have all come to serve the purpose of cultural foundation myths. A foundation myth broadly functions to orient a people or civilization in the world because it provides a grand narrative and archetypes that help them to make sense of reality by locating them in history and the world. Furthermore, it provides a guiding distinction between ultimate good and ultimate evil and determines what is considered sacred. Harry Foshdick argued that man's life is like a tree. Branches demand roots, every increase in the superstructure giving purchase for the wind to get hold upon requires a new grip on the steadfast earth, and that increased extension calls for increased stability, end quote. This increased cultural stability is provided by consolidating the foundation myth or myths that hold things together. The Bible reminds us of the importance of building your house on a solid foundation. A house that is built on the foundation of rock can withstand heavy rain, winds and floods, while a house that is built on sand suffers a different fate. As we read in Matthew 7 verse 25, And then the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The nature, quality and vigor, therefore, of a culture's foundation myth or myths play significant roles in determining its destiny. A foundation myth is not set in stone. In the Western world, we have observed how the old foundation myths have been altered or even replaced by the two world wars and colonialism. In South Africa, apartheid has become the foundation myth of the new South Africa. Quentin Ferreira refers to this new South African origin myth as the eternal apartheid. In the Western world, you live in the post-World War I and II era. And in South Africa, you live in the post-1994 or post-apartheid era. Everything from the zeitgeist, rhetoric, architecture, culture, art, politics, prevailing stereotypes, education and more in the West as in South Africa operate within, are interpreted according to and are influenced by these foundation myths' frameworks and paradigms. To demonstrate this point, consider the key aspect of a foundation myth as the provider of a conception of what constitutes ultimate good and ultimate evil. In the apartheid as foundational myth framework, the national party or NP and the system of apartheid are designated as the ultimate evils. This explains why politicians, journalists, academics and even lay people in post-apartheid South Africa frantically scramble to liken their opponents or those with whom they ideologically disagree as supporters of apartheid or sharing the ideas of NP leaders of the past. You see this in the sentiments nurtured by the South African National Congress or ANC rhetoric expressed towards opposition parties such as the Democratic Alliance or DA, as well as the DA's own rhetoric towards the ANC. On the other side of the moral spectrum of the New South Africa's foundation myth, there is a constant virtue signaling tug of war to claim the moral high ground of best representing the incarnation of ultimate good as personified by Nelson Mandela between opposition parties and the ruling ANC. Quentin Ferreira highlights another integral aspect of the post-apartheid foundation myth when he argues that, and I quote, at its core, the eternal apartheid describes the societal forces which arose from the clash between Western modernity and African culture, 
and can best be understood as the post-apartheid frame through which our society is interpreted. Close quote. The post-apartheid foundation myth's framing of reality and the state of affairs rest on the archetypal interplay between what Ferreira calls the unrepentant white and the perpetually victimized African. Every societal interaction, conflict or issue is interpreted through this lens. Therefore, in the post-apartheid paradigm, institutions, symbols and cultural practices that are rooted in Western civilization are framed as tyrannical alien order. And any attempt to preserve these or acknowledging their value is met with deep suspicion and antagonism. In the Western world, one sees the post-World War I and II foundation myth play out in a cliché so widely and frequently observed that it is popularly ridiculed. Hence the coining of Godwin's Law, which states that the longer an internet argument goes on, the higher the probability becomes that something or someone will be compared to Adolf Hitler or the Nazis. This was particularly apparent during Donald Trump's presidency, where Hitler comparisons were a dime a dozen and the label fascist experienced a new revival. If you dare to disagree with, question or criticize the ideals, figures or values that are held sacred by the post-World War I and II foundation myth, you are accused of being a sympathizer or representative of the evils and vices of the other side of this rigid moral dichotomy. In the South African context, any criticism or alternative proposed to the values or ideals of the post-apartheid rainbow nation South Africa gets you labeled as an apartheid sympathizer or a racist longing to return to a segregated past. The post-World War I and II and post-apartheid eras, both constructed on violent and traumatic foundation myths, are consequently gripped in the claws of a disruptive and divisive paranoia. There is a Nazi in every patriotic neighbor and an apartheid apologist in every proud Afrikaner. This paranoia leads to the purging of any statue, monument, street name, ideal, or cultural symbol that might reference or remotely connect to the ultimate evil that is identified in the new reigning foundation myth. Every statue that was built before the new era, every symbol that is incompatible with the new origin myth's pantheon, every value or tradition that does not strictly adhere to the new myth's ideals are all seen as potential seeds of returning to the deplorable past and resurrecting an old evil. Therefore, they are all mercilessly attacked and cleansed from public view in a ritualistic, exorcistic fashion to rid society of any evil spirits that might possess unsuspecting citizens and to nail shut demonic doorways that might lead back to a bygone era. In South Africa, the constant assaults on Afrikaans, which the eternal apartheid myth designates as the oppressive language of the previous regime, and the banning of the old South African flag, even in the privacy of one's own home, all serve as examples of such cleansing rituals. In the West and in South Africa, the origin myths of old that were characterized by themes of birth, growth, building, courage, beauty, and aspirations have been replaced by new myths that are characterized by death, suffering, oppression, destruction, injustice, and guilt. Rather than being rooted in the good, these new myths are nailed on every wall in town on public display for all to see. Not as a triumphant victory song, but as a dark, foreboding warning. Our foundational myths are no longer centered around what we seek to build or preserve, but rather on what we must topple, stamp out, deface, and destroy. Their tool is no longer the plow, but rather the axe. In the West, any reverence of the age-old values and traditions of your ancestors or the appreciation of your heritage and history is viewed through the lens of the new foundation myth as a desperate longing for a past that is filled with injustice, cruelty, and oppression. In South Africa, any Afrikaner organization or person who does not perpetually signal their inherited guilt or confess to their collective complicity in the original sin of apartheid, or who does not publicly voice ethno-masochistic sentiments, is attacked and called a racist who is unrepentant for their sins. When I recently penned criticism of some of the destructive practical consequences of sacred liberal post-apartheid values, I was accused of probably having a poster of Eugene Ter Blanche on my wall. This may sound absurd, but it makes perfect sense within the eternal apartheid myth scriptures. Of course, witches float. Every archetype has both a light and a shadow side, and both must be acknowledged, confronted, and explored. 
the wise king who archetypically represents a source of knowledge, wisdom, and tradition that brings order and prosperity to society, has as its shadow the tyrant king who reminds us that excessive order will serve to stultify and suffocate growth. The problem is, however, that the post-World War I and II and post-apartheid foundation myths are one-sided in that they are completely engulfed in shadow and fearful obsession with the dark. In their new foundation myths, the Western and Africana culture's virtues are superficially framed as universal, while their vices are assuredly declared unique. A healthy foundation myth affirms that the world is better off and richer with the existence of your culture or civilization, while a toxic foundation myth asserts the opposite and implies that you have a moral duty to remove yourself from it. As Arnold Toynbee said, great civilizations are not murdered, they commit suicide, end quote. At the core of the new Western foundation myth, you find the spotlight on two devastating and traumatizing world wars, the developing and dropping of the atomic bomb, the horrors of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, and colonialism. These are held up as the characteristic bitter fruit of the West's Faustian striving and the fated result of its values. If these are maliciously reflected as the only bricks of your foundation, it is only natural that the walls of your home will be graffitied, often by your own hand, with the phrase, the world would have been better off without you. When your civilization or culture is confronted with the realities of a toxic foundation myth that has taken root, the best solution is to create new myths, erect new statues or monuments, and to rediscover and rejuvenate the cultural treasures from your past to serve as cornerstones of that which you are dreaming of. Do as Paul Creer said, take from the past all that is beautiful and build the future with it, end quote. We should not be naive or blindly romantic about the past. Returning to it is impossible, or even undesirable. Soren Kierkegaard was right when he observed that life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. End quote. In the West's idealistic strive to save the world by westernizing it, it has neglected the maintenance of its own house. Similarly, Afrikaners were so absorbed in pure self-preservation that we lost sight of what needed preservation. Mark 8 verse 36 warns us, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Unfortunately, while we were distracted and through neglect, the cultural gardens of both the West and the Afrikaners' souls have been overrun by weeds that are choking the delicate, rare, and sacred flowers that were so revered and ritualistically and carefully tended to by our ancestors. Our culture is our precious lifeblood, which was not created by us, but for us. We are only temporary custodians of it until we too must pass it on. It has always been, and will always be, much easier to squander an inheritance than to create one. If you like this type of content, you can uh, click like, it helps out the video. You can also subscribe for more. I will be uploading more essay videos like this. And then also, if you have any thoughts or comments that you want to share regarding the content of this video, you can go leave it in the comment section. I read all of them and try to respond to as most as I can. Enjoy the rest of your day. Have an excellent week and God bless. And a lot of people fighting back against this nonsense. Conscious Caracol, whoever he or she is, is one of them.